Hi, everybody. Hope everybody's having a good day today so far. Today, we're going to talk about order relations, preferences, and utility functions. Now, we'll begin with several examples and definitions uh, of various kinds of order relations that are all important in what we're going to do. Then we'll talk about preferences, and we'll talk about utility functions or utility representations of preferences. And then I'll give you uh, a little exercise, and at the end of the lecture, I will provide a, a solution to that exercise. So let's get started, and uh, we will begin with one of the examples, one of the binary relations that we saw in the previous lecture. And so our first example will be the greater than or equal to, or of course less than or equal to, which works the same way, the greater than or equal to um, binary relation on a set of real numbers. Now, you'll recall from our previous lecture that this relation is transitive, it's anti-symmetric, and it's complete. Now, it turns out that there are lots of other important relations, kind of ordering relations, like this order relation, that are also transitive, anti-symmetric, and complete. So, in light of uh, the kind of things we've done a number of times before, you're probably not going to be surprised for me to say that we're going to elevate those properties to a definition. And so, Here's our first definition, and that is that we're going to refer to this order and other relations that have uh, the same properties as a total order. Now, what are some other relations that have this same property? Uh, let's take, for example, um, the alphabetical order. So let's say um, the 26 letters in the English alphabet, if we have them in alphabetical order, that is a transitive, asymmetric, and complete order. So it's a total order. Or if you like, uh, the, if our, if the set that we're ordering isn't the 26 letters in the English alphabet, of course, could be a different number of letters in it, different than the Cyrillic alphabet, and so on. If it's instead, say, the words in a dictionary, then those words are in the dictionary in alphabetical order. So again, that is a total order on the set of words in the dictionary, or the set of entries in an encyclopedia that are in alphabetical order. Now, there is another ordering that uh, is a total order that you are going to see early on in your first microeconomics course in the graduate program. And that's an ordering on, not on the reals and not on letters of the alphabet, but on uh, vectors in Euclidean space, uh, n-tuples in Rn. And it's an ordering called the lexicographic order. And as I say, you'll see that early on in your microeconomics course. We will also see that uh, one or two lectures down the road here because it provides a really good example. Now, what is our uh, second example? Our second example is going to be the subset relation. So now we're talking about, let's say, any arbitrary set capital X. And the subset relation isn't a relation on the set. Well, it's not a relation on the set X. It's a relation on the collection of subsets of X. So if X is this, the set where we're looking at subsets of X, then this is a relation on 2 to the X, the set of all subsets of X. So uh, you'll notice that this relation is kind of similar to this one. I mean, this is like smaller than, so we could just as well here have the relation less than or equal as well as greater than or equal. Let me make that a semicolon there so we can see that it's uh, 
a, a different relation. And so this relation differs from the, the relation here, the order here, in that it is not complete. Here, for any two real numbers, x and y, we can say either x is greater than or equal to y, or y is greater than or equal to x, or of course, possibly both, uh, if y is equal to x. But here, we can't do that. We could have two subsets of x, elements of 2 to the x, let's say set A and set B, where A is not a subset of B, B is not a subset of A. So this relation is not complete, and it differs from this relation only in that property. So again, this relation and similar relations uh, are important enough that we elevate those properties to a definition. And here we're talking about the definition of a partial order. So a partial order, like this, generalizing this, elevating this to a definition, uh, a partial order is one that is transitive and anti-symmetric, just like this, uh, but not necessarily complete. Could be complete, in which case it would be a total order. So this would be a special kind of total. Well, this would be a special kind of a partial order that's total. So the relation is transitive, anti-symmetric, and reflexive, because any set um, is a subset of itself. So here we have another kind of order, a partial order. And what are some other examples of partial orders? Well, one is the idea of um, a divisor. The notation we use for the divisor relation is this. We say A divides B, or A is a divisor of B. This is an ordering relation on the natural numbers. And so an example would be, say, 9 divides 18, 6 divides 18, 8 divides 24, or is a divisor of 24. So this relation is transitive and anti-symmetric and reflexive is it's just easy to check. So that's another example of a partial order. Another example of a partial order, one that's really important for economics, is uh, a relation on the, on, uh, the points in Euclidean space, or n-tuples in Euclidean space, in Rn. And we define this relation by saying x is at least as big as y if x if the if every component of the x vector or the x tuple is at least as large as the corresponding component of the y tuple so that would be written out more formally that would be if xi is greater than or equal to yi for each of the components. So that's, as I said, that's sometimes called the component-wise ordering of, or order uh, on Rn, ordering of n-tuples, or points, or vectors. And uh, in economics, this ordering actually shows up a lot, and it's uh, called the Pareto ordering, it's called the efficiency order or ordering. And of course, uh, we want to check what the properties of this, uh, of this relation are. It's easy to check that this relation is transitive. That's easy to see. Uh, if x is at least as big as y and y is at least as big as z, then all the components of x are greater or equal to the y components, and all those components are greater than or equal to z components, so we get xi greater than or equal to zi for each i. So this is transitive. It's also easy to see that it is uh, anti-symmetric, and to see that it is uh, reflexive. So this is a, another partial order 
Uh, again, one that's important for economics. And the next example is one that is certainly important for economics, uh, one that we have already seen in the preceding lecture, and that's the notion of preference. So here we uh, want to describe a decision maker's preference by a utility function. And then we're going to take that utility function and use that to define a, an ordering, some kind of an ordering relation, as we did in the preceding lecture. So here we, we say, let's say that we're given um, some real valued function, a utility function, we'll call it, on the set of alternatives that the decision maker has to choose from among. So the utility function describes or defines our preference ordering uh, in the following sense, as we did last time. That is, we say x is at least as good as y if u of x is greater than or equal to u of y. And so, uh, what are the properties of this relation? Well, we saw that last time in the last lecture, and that is this relation here is transitive. It is actually complete. It's reflexive, but it's not anti-symmetric. It's not anti-symmetric because we could have two distinct elements, two distinct alternatives in the set to choose from, say alternative x and alternative y, where u of x is greater than or equal to u of y, and u of y is greater than or equal to u of x. In other words, where u of x, where, where x and y are assigned the same utility number, they have the same utility, but they're distinct alternatives in capital X. So that immediately tells us that this relation in general is not anti-symmetric. So it's not one of these kinds of relations, but it's important. So you might, <laughs> might not be surprised that again we elevate the properties of this relation to another definition, definition of another kind of ordering. And then in particular we just use the properties that it's transitive and reflexive while this one is complete, uh, we don't actually generalize that, the completeness. We're just generalizing the transitivity and the reflexivity of the relation. And you'll notice that I've uh, written here that it's a weak preorder. Now, the reason that I've called it a weak preorder is because of the next example. In fact, the next two examples, the last two examples we're going to do here, are both uh, relations, ordering relations, that are defined from this ordering relation. So we're going to, so they're going to be defined on the set X of alternatives as well. And so we have first X strictly better, strictly preferred to Y, if, and now I'm going to write this in a particular way here, that x is strictly preferred to y if x is at least as good as y, and y is not at least as good as x. And you'll, so you'll notice that I could have defined this uh, relation in terms of the utility function, but I instead defined it in terms of the, the, uh, the preordering uh, that we have here. Uh, I'll come back and say something about that in just a minute. And so the last example that we have here is to say that x tilde y, that's supposed to be a little tilde there. Let's see if I can make that a little, a little better. Well, that didn't come out so good. <laughs> so, okay, so let's write that again. x tilde y and what this means in terms of preference is that the decision maker is indifferent between x and y. And so 
That's going to be the case if x is at least as good as y and y is at least as good as x. So again, I could have defined either one of these or each of these by instead writing u of x greater than or equal to u of y and u of y not greater than or equal to u of x, and here by saying u of x equals u of y. But I wrote it this way because had I done it in terms of the utility functions, that would have been just specific to this particular uh, pre-order defined from utility functions. But again, pre-orders are a, de a general kind of order relation, not just confined to utility functions. So I wanted to uh, write the definition of each of these relations in terms of the weak pre-ordering that generated them here, uh, because for any pre-ordering, not just one defined by a real-valued function, for any pre-ordering, we can always define the what we'll call the strict uh, the strict pre-order, and so we have that here, the strict pre-order uh, that's associated with our pre-order here, and we have our equivalence relation that is associated with this pre-order here. And you can also think of this as the, as clearly dividing this relation into two parts, because you can see here that this is exactly what's going on here, that in this case it's all the things that are at least as good as y, uh, but y is not, not as good, and here's all the things at least as good as y, where y is as good. So this kind of partitions the, uh, this relation into two parts or two subsets, subrelations. This you could think of as the asymmetric part of this relation, because clearly it is asymmetric, and this one you can think of as the symmetric part of this relation. And as you can see here in the definitions, indeed, we say a strict preorder like this is a binary relation that's transitive and irreflexive, and the uh, equivalence relation is a binary relation that is transitive, reflexive, and symmetric, as this one is here. So you can check, in fact, I think we did that in the previous lecture, we check uh, these properties of both this relation and this relation. So here, uh, I'm going to take this off the screen here. And so what I want to do now is uh, first draw a kind of a diagram of uh, what things look like when the set of alternatives here is Euclidean, a part of Euclidean space. So, of course, use R2, and what we're going to get, of course, is the familiar indifference curves or indifference map, and so we would have something like this. And this is going to be completely familiar to any economics student from Intermediate Micro, Intermediate Microeconomics. And so here we have the amounts of two goods that some individual might want to purchase or consume. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to draw one of the indifference curves. So uh, let's actually uh, identify a particular point as well here. So let's say this is I'll call it x bar, and uh, this indifference curve is really the set of all the bundles or alternatives here. And in fact, let's write some of this down here. Let's write that what we're doing here has x equal to r2, r2 plus, because it's the non-negative quadrant of r2, and uh, this is the, the indifference curve is the set of all alternatives in X, uh, and here I could have written R2+, plus, but I'm writing X because I want to define this a little more generally, such that 
x is at, sorry, not at least as good as, <laughs> this is the, this is the set of all alternatives or bundles such that x is indifferent to x bar or the decision maker is indifferent between x and x bar. And uh, we have a notation and a name for that set, not just in uh, consumption theory, but in general in decision theory or in general for order relations and uh, equivalence relations. We say that this is the equivalence class of the element x bar in x. So for any element of our, of the set on which our binary relations defined, uh, we can define the set of all the other alternatives that are equivalent to x bar and this is the notation we use for that, and we call this the equivalence class of the point or the alternative x bar. So that's what we have here. This then, the indifference curve is exactly the equivalence class associated with any of the points on the curve. This x bar or another point here, this would still be the same uh, equivalence class. And there are now two other important sets that we uh, want to work with analytically when we're working with pre-orders. And those two sets are called the upper contour set and the lower contour set of a point. So you can see here in the first definition, the upper contour set of x bar is the set of all the alternatives that are R related. So here I've used the notation R because there are different symbols that are used, and of course we had the divisor symbol, there are different symbols that are used for these order relations. And so I'm just using R here as a kind of generic symbol for our order relation. In fact, I've said here binary relation, but really these ideas, upper and lower contour set, are really ones that we use for order relations, really, of the kind of order relations we have here. So let's see what these upper and lower contour sets look like in this particular setting. The upper contour set would be everything that's at least as good as x bar, so it would be everything on the indifference curve or above it. So this would be r x bar according to this definition. And of course, I could use, instead of r, I could use the symbol that we have here for the relation. So this would be just two different ways I could write this, where r is, in fact, the this relation here with a little curly greater than symbol, the preference relation. And then, of course, the lower contour set would be everything down here. So this would be x bar r or x bar better than or as, at least as good as. So upper contour set, lower contour set. Those are uh, both sets that are going to be important for us in working with uh, pre-orders, in particular in working with preferences. Okay, let's use this space here that I've just created uh, to draw another diagram, not the diagram for our preference, but let's draw a diagram to kind of see what's going on, if we can, with this component-wise or Pareto or efficiency ordering on Rn. And of course, we're going to have n equal to 2 so that we can draw a diagram. So let's take, uh, as we did here, a particular point x bar in R2. Let's just put that right here. That's x bar. 
And now let's uh, look at both the upper and lower contour sets for this point X bar. Well, I think it's pretty easy to see that the upper contour set, well, it consists of all the points that are larger than X bar, and that means all the points that are larger in both components, and of course, larger or equal, because uh, the equal is included here. So that would be everything along this line and along this line, and of course going on indefinitely far in each direction. So each of the points along here and here is larger than X bar because, for example, along this line here, the second component is the same as the second component of X bar, but the first component's bigger. So each component is as large or larger, same along here, and of course for all the other points in here. So this would be R X bar, or again, we could use the notation, uh, specific notation for this relation, for this order relation. And then for the lower contour set, again, I'll do that in pink like I did here, that would be all of the points along here. That's supposed to be a nice straight line, not kind of bowed like this. And all the points down here and all the points here. So this would be X bar R or uh, X bar with a little symbol for the, for the order relation. And so this would be our upper and lower contour sets for this order relation, this pre-order. And now, in a few moments, I'm actually going to uh, give you an exercise that you can do with this order relation that will, I think, bring out several of the properties that the relation has that are important from the point of view of economics. Now, in economics, when we have any one of these order relations, in particular, either one of these two order relations, this Pareto or efficiency order relation or the preference order relation, what we're almost always interested in is points in Rn, in Rn or in X, that are a maximum, that maximize, for example, a utility function or maximize a profit function in the sense of efficiency, that maximize efficiency. So we're interested in the notion of a maximum point or a maximum element of the underlying set that we have uh, our relation defined on. And so that's what we have here. We have a definition of both a maximum element and then we have a definition of something called a maximal element. But let's focus on the more familiar maximum element. So uh, an element maximizes a utility function or a function in general if it provides a value. For example, I use here x hat as the notation for the maximum element. So if we have an x hat such that u of x hat is greater than or equal to u of x for any x, any other alternative, then that's a maximum. That's our, you know, familiar concept of a maximum or a maximizer of the function. So here we have the analogous or paralleled idea of uh, a maximum element of the set of alternatives, but it's a maximum not in the sense of a function, the maximum in the sense of our order relation. And of course, they coincide in this case because the order relation here is defined in terms of the utility function. But we might, of course, have pre-orders or partial orders or other kinds of orders than this that aren't necessarily defined in terms of a function. And we still want to be able to talk about uh, an alternative, an element, being a maximum 
in terms of the relation. And so that's what the definition says here. It says that our x hat is a maximum for the relation if every other element, every element in the set of alternatives that are available, every other element over which our ordering is defined is one such that x hat is at least as good as those other elements. So x hat has to be as good as any other element that's available to us in the set that the order is defined on. That Again, that's familiar. A minimum would be just the reverse. It's worse than or lower than any other element. So that's fine so long as a maximum element exists. But we're going to see situations in which we have orderings, pre-ordering, a pre-order, a partial order, where there isn't any maximum element. In that case, we're interested in whether there is a maximal element or multiple maximal elements. And so a maximal element here would be one where there is no other element that is strictly bigger, strictly better, strictly preferred to our x hat. And now you could say that, well, they appear to be the same thing. And indeed, if the order relation is complete, it's easy to show that they are equivalent. They are the same thing. And moreover, even if the relation's incomplete, uh, any, any element that's a maximum will certainly be maximal. Again, easy to show, good exercise for you to do that. But we can have elements that are maximal, but aren't a maximum. And so, to give an idea how that might work, I'm going to give you an exercise at the end of the lecture. The exercise is going to be about this component-wise ordering that I've said is so important in economics. And one of the things you'll have to do in that exercise is to work out the difference between the set of maximum elements and the set of maximal elements for this ordering. Now we want to spend the rest of this lecture talking about the relation between a utility representation of someone's preference and the pre-ordering representation of someone's preference. So we actually have here two alternative analytical devices, if you like, for defining or describing a person's preferences. And, of course, use a utility function. We say that a person prefers one alternative to another if it gets more utility, a larger value of the utility function. And here we say directly that uh, x is preferred to y uh, as part of the as, as a part of the uh, binary relation, a part of the preorder. So these are kind of alternative ways to describe preference. But notice that there is kind of a real difference here in that people don't really have utility functions, presumably. I don't have a utility function. I don't have a utility meter in me that tells me how much utility I get from a particular bundle, for example, that I might consume. But on the other hand, uh, using this pre-order to define preferences is really kind of a natural, intuitively appealing way to describe preference. We could say for any two alternatives, it's a binary relation, for any two alternatives, X and Y, any two alternative bundles, I could say whether I prefer X, whether I prefer Y, or whether I'm indifferent between the two. So the pre-order seems like a natural, uh, appealing way to describe preference. Utility functions are kind of, in a way, forced, not really, we don't really think they're fundamental or they're somehow the right primitive way of describing preference. So what we want to be able to do is if we describe someone's preference by a pre-order, a preference pre-order, we would like to be able to represent it by a utility function. Why? Because pre-orders are not easy to work with. They're awkward and cumbersome 
to work with analytically. Functions, on the other hand, are analytically quite tractable. They're good to work with. So what we would like to be able to do is, if we have someone's preference described by a pre-order, we would like to see if we can represent it by a utility function. And that's what the uh, definition we have here says. It says that a utility function for a given binary relation, for a given order relation, let's say, I've used R again as a generic symbol for the, for the relation, for the, the binary relation or pre-order. And so we say that a utility function represents or is a representation of the pre-order exactly if this condition here is true. So let's just put a little star by that to give it a name. That's the condition we saw all the way going back to the last, uh, our previous uh, lecture. And so this is what we mean when we say that a utility function represents a pre-order or a preference pre-order. And uh, we often say that the utility function is a representation of the pre-order. Well, of course, when we have a utility function, it defines a perfectly good pre-order and the utility function is a utility function for that pre-order. It represents that pre-order. But the problem is we don't want to go in that direction. We want to go in the other direction. We want to start with the notion of a pre-order that is our characterization or definition of the individual's preference. And from that, we want to be able to say there is a utility function that we can use to represent the pre-order in this sense. So that's the way we want to go. And so while it's straightforward to go from the utility function to here, it's, it seems kind of intuitive that it should be straightforward to go the other way, to start with the preference pre-order and identify a utility function that will represent it. It turns out not so simple. That's actually a fairly deep question, and that we're going to take up in the next lecture, after we have first uh, talked about more about equivalence relations and about partitions and the relation between the two. And then we'll use those ideas together with what we've already done to try to see what we can say about finding a utility function to represent a given pre-order. So that's where we want to go for our next lecture. Now what I want you to do is to take this exercise and work out the solutions to the various parts of the exercise. Now you'll notice that the exercise is about this uh, component-wise or Pareto or efficiency ordering that I've said is so pervasive in economics. And when I say I would like you to work out the solutions to the various parts of the exercise, I don't mean just give the answer yes or no, like when it asks, is the ordering uh, anti-symmetric or is it complete? Don't just say yes or no. The idea is to verify your answer by giving a, a proof. Now, these are the proofs here are all simple. In some cases, one sentence, very simple, straightforward proofs, nothing difficult or deep here, but it'll still be worth your while to actually work through this yourself rather than to watch me work through the solution. You need to kind of do this on your own. Now, what I'm going to do is ask you to pause the video here, or you can close out the video and come back, and then I am going to work through the solutions myself, and then you can use that to check my solutions against your solutions. <laughs> Yours might be better than mine. So uh, let's do that, and then uh, you pause the video, and then I'll come back and I'll, uh, and I'll work out the solutions.